Hi, and welcome to today's session of Lunches with Legends, where we connect with some of the most illustrious uh, business leaders in the world while supporting the vital healthcare organizations in our communities. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the key sponsors of this series, especially our gold sponsor, Franklin Templeton. We're deeply grateful for your friendship and very generous support. We would also like to thank our other lead sponsors, RPIA, Ventera Realty, the Creek and McConnell Group, TD Bank, KPMG and Merit Asset Management. We really appreciate your generosity. I wanna remind everyone that 100% of the dollars that you donate through Lunches with Legends goes, pediatric, goes towards pediatric mental health in our community. So if you haven't yet made your donation, please take a moment, go to the donation page on the site. We'd so appreciate your support. Now, without any further ado, I would like to introduce our very special guest today, the legendary Jeff Immelt. Jeff, uh, Jeff Immelt was the former chairman and CEO of GE, where he spent 16 years revamping the company's strategy, global footprint, workforce, and culture. During his tenure, he led several transformations that doubled earnings, reestablished market leadership in essential industries, and quadrupled emerging market revenue. Uh, during his time at GE, he was also named as one of the world's best CEOs by Barron's. GE was named America's most admired company by Fortune magazine and one of the most respected companies by Barron's and Financial Times. After retiring from GE, Jeff joined New Enterprise Associates, or uh, better known as NEA, which is a $20 billion venture capital firm where he is a venture partner and currently serves on the boards of various private and public companies. Jeff is also the author of Hot Seat, which is a refreshingly candid account of Jeff's journey, the crises he faced along the way and the lessons that he learned. I am, I'm actually in the middle of the book. Sorry, Jeff didn't finish it for today, but highly recommend it. And um, aside from all of his uh, commercial achievements, Jeff uh, has received 15 honorary degrees and numerous awards for his uh, business and civic and philanthropic leadership, which included chairing President Obama's Council on Jobs and Competitiveness and the Business Council. He also served as uh, on, on the President's Economic Recovery and Advisory Board and the Board of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome the one and only Jeff Immelt. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. Great, Mo. Great to be with you. Thanks very much for having me. Thanks. So let's, you know, after reading through your extraordinary bio, I um, naturally I can't help but wonder what your parents put in your Wheaties. So I, I uh, you know, besides your various God-given abilities and some good fortune, what what do you think it was about your upbringing that gave you the capacity to be sitting here today? Yes, yeah, so, I'm so great to be with you. You know, I had great parents. I grew up in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, classic Midwest uh, U.S. middle class uh, background. Uh, my father actually worked for GE for almost 40 years himself, so I kind of grew up in a, uh, you know, kind of working class uh, family and ethos. Uh, you know, I, I always tell my students today that, uh, you know, careers are about training, it's about uh, experiences that you have, but it's also about the things that you have uh, that you learn at your parents' knee. And so when I think back on those experiences, uh, they, they taught me how to learn. You know, so I was always curious. I was a math major as a kid. Uh, you know, I was always encouraged to kind of figure things out and, and explore and experience. And, you know, basically, but until I was 18, I had never been out of a 50 mile radius of where I grew up. Yet I've lived a global life and in my career, I had to figure out things like China and the Middle East and things like that. Uh, they taught me to give to others. And I think business is a lot about relationships. It's a lot about connections. It's a lot about uh, building trust and teams. Mm -hmm. And I think I learned that at a very early age and played team sports and things like that. So that was, a, that was an important part of my up, upbringing. And I'd say lastly, they taught me to take a punch. You know, my, my parents never allowed excuses. They never allowed whining. They never allowed like, uh, you know, somebody else did it to me. It was always like, you got to figure it out. You got to suck it up. You got to do it on your own. And uh, 
in some way, shape or form, you know, like uh, learning and giving and taking a punch. Uh, those three things I learned at a very early age that helped me as I traverse my career. Right. So speaking of taking punches, you know, as I've been going through the book, you, you've, you know, you've led GE through some of the greatest crises over the last 25 years, right? Could you talk a little bit about some of those and, and perhaps the insights that you now uh, brought to bear in kind of in your current uh, role advising other corporate leaders and entrepreneurs and navigating the, the most recent crisis, right? The most recent pandemic. Yeah, no, look, I think if, you know, kind of the first half of my career from 1980 to 2000 was always going to be viewed as very tranquil. If you were an American businessman, you know, the, the economy was good. The U.S. was the center of the world. There wasn't much technical innovation. And then, you know, you turn the page and, you know, we kind of lived through 9-11, uh, the financial crisis, the Fukushima nuclear disaster, the BP oil spill, COVID and multiple cycles and things like that. So we just live in this incredible era of volatility and, and transformation. And, you know, in some way, shape or form, I kind of sat through all of those. I, I guess what I learned was uh, good leaders absorb fear. You, you know, you, you, you find people are either accelerators of fear or shock absorbers against fear. And, and when the world is uncertain, you know, sometimes you have to uh, give people a path forward and not scare them. And, and I learned about that. You have to make decisions. You know, Mo, after 9-11, uh, we owned 1,200 aircraft in GE Capital. Almost every airline in the world was going bankrupt. And so we, we lent out almost $30 billion in 90 days after 9-11. I didn't really know what I was doing so much. You know, I, I was, I, people would explain, you know, we would have these nightly uh, crisis sessions and people would say, look, if we don't give Airline X a billion dollars by tomorrow morning, they're going to go bankrupt. And I would turn to my vice chairman and say, okay, what do you guys think? And they say, blah, blah, blah. Okay, let's do it. You know, and, and, and you find that you, you have no place to hide. You have to make decisions. Uh, you learn who you can trust and who you can't trust. So people, people step forward or, or step back and you learn to be a communicator, right? You learn that you have to uh, communicate every day, even when sometimes you're saying that you don't know. But maybe the most important thing and the relevance to COVID, I think, Mo, is during a crisis, you have to hold two truths at the same time, right? Um, and you have to know that really bad things can happen and things are going to always get worse, but there's also going to be a future, right? So I've now seen the commercial aviation industry after 9-11 and, and, and COVID. And if in both moments, you had doubled down on the commercial aviation industry, doubled your investment, you would have made an incredible amount of money because after 9-11, nobody knew that there would be a future for flight. During COVID, we'd say, we're never gonna get on a plane again. We're never gonna fly again. What happened after 9-11? We had a 18-year renaissance in the commercial aviation industry. What's happening now? People are flocking back to airports and things like that. And so. Too frequently, leaders lose sight of holding two truths and how important that is to lead to uh, future investments. So, so I love that two truth mental model. Um, and so is there anything, is there any other uh, tools in, that you sort of advise entrepreneurs or business leaders today on to optimize their decision making through volatility yeah. and criticism and, and obviously you've, you've had a little bit of the, uh, experience with that. You know, what, what stories do you bring to bear as you're kind of um, consulting or advising or what other tools do you bring to bear in those conversations? Yeah, look, I, I think during a crisis, what I advise entrepreneurs or other people living through it is that it's, a, it's really a pass-fail test. It's not a glamor contest. You either make it through or you don't and, and you don't need to worry about getting dirt on your pants as you go through it. Um, the, the financial crisis, just for sheer fright, kind of the 90 days after Lehman Brothers went bankrupt, if you were in the financial service industry, you have never experienced sheer fright of that magnitude before or after. And you had to make decisions each and every day, each and every week. And if you were in financial services, you were the enemy. So the media was just brutalizing you. So at the end of September of 2008, Washington Mutual declares bankruptcy on a Friday and our credit default swaps 
blew out. And, you know, a couple bankers from Goldman Sachs came up to Fairfoot, Connecticut on a Friday night and they said, you've got to raise as much equity as you can uh, next Monday. And, and it, it, you know, you, you've got to get the commercial paper under control, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And my first my first instinct was to say, well, F you, I'm not going to do that, right? Have you, have you looked outside? It's raining. You know, we can't, we can't do that. And they said, no, you got to get, you got to go for $18 billion. So the next morning I call a board meeting, telephonic, no Zoom or anything like that. And I say to my board, hey, you know, guys, you know, it's kind of tough out there. We're going to, we're going to blah, blah, blah. And we're going to raise $18 billion on Monday and silence on the other end of the, like just dead silence. And finally, uh, Roger Penske, who is one of my favorite directors, he's an entrepreneur, things like that. He says, let's get the money. And then everybody says, okay, let's go get the money. So then, you know, we called Buffett um, and tried to get him because that would help anchor the raise. Uh, and it rolls to Sunday night when we had to kind of go forward. And uh, the US Congress was supposed to pass a bailout bill, they, it had failed. Seven U.S. banks declared bankruptcy that Sunday, and we had to make the call on Sunday night. You know whether or not to, we were going to launch in Asia and try to raise the money. All the markets looked awful, and the weight of the world was just on my shoulders. Right, I, I just never felt that much stress. We decided not to go. Uh, people couldn't even close their stocks that Monday. The market fell so dramatically. And then two days later, we, we got some stable water. Buffett came in, we raised the money. It was probably the most important decision I ever made as CEO. And I got crushed in the media press. So I advise, I advise everybody to say, this is a pass fail test, guys. Yeah. You either make it or you don't. There's no style points. And uh, you know when you can look backwards and tell the stories, that's a good thing. When you're crushed, that's a bad thing. So just uh, you got to make decisions. And so, by the way, I'm just actually very quite curious. When you called Warren Buffett and then eventually entrusted you with three billion dollars in your time of need, um, do you, you know, how do you how do you navigate that conversation? Do you recall what he asked you to in order to make the decision? Yeah, like, he just kind of says, "What are you guys doing?" And I said, "Look, here's here's the reservoirs of cash." I said, "Look, Warren, you know, the way I look at it, we're in a nine inning game. This is the second inning. Okay, <laughs> here are like the six other moves I have up my sleeve." after this, that was exactly what he wanted to hear. What he, what he wanted to hear was this wasn't the final step that we had, you know, cause, cause Warren, one of the things that makes him such a great investor is, is he thinks risk first, right? And, and so um, I told him we had a bunch of other things we could go do, he liked that. And uh, he had done a similar deal with Goldman. So it made it easy to do. And uh, you know, that was, uh, that was, it was, just great. You, you know, Mo, look, if, if you go back the second half of September 2008, you know, we were trying to become a bank holding company. There was like a bunch of stuff that uh, that we couldn't do. And we were a lar super large finance company. We were on kind of an island of one and we had to really fend for ourselves. And, you know, that was the only way we made it through. And by the way, that, that in itself is surprising. I, I don't know if most people are even aware that uh, GE is just this massive land lender across numerous numerous industries and it was you know principally yeah, you know so you know our issue and again it was our fault it was my fault uh we let the institution become too big and you know we weren't really in and really any of the toxic stuff per se but at our size you know it was when the capital markets uh, get shake you know get shaken we get shaken because we were very dependent on the capital markets for our, our business model sure sure and and you talked a little bit about you know, the the nature of uh, corporate America and the economy in uh, sort of the 80s to the 2000s. And naturally you stepped in sort of at the tail end of that into the CEO seat. You know, has the kind of leadership we need today changed? In other words, if, if you were, uh, if you would have kind of approached your role and you were starting as a CEO today, the CEO of GE today, uh, how would you approach it differently than you did some 20 years ago? Yeah, look, I mean, I think it's different both, you know, what I would call environmentally and also substantively, right? So if you, if you look at the job in the year 2000, it was largely a private job. You know, my, my predecessor was very public, but most people didn't know who any of the CEOs 
in the country were really and that that was just a, a it was viewed as a private sector today they're public jobs right it doesn't matter what company uh, you're running you're expected to have a point of view on georgia voting law or diversity or in the environment a whole series of other things and that's just the way it is it's not good or bad it's just a right. change i'd say strategically you know um you could you could get away in the year 2000 by being broad but not deep you know we were a conglomerate we were in media and aircraft engines and healthcare that kind of worked in the 90s it doesn't work today today you've got to be deep uh, you can still be in more than one business but you've got to be really fundamental in in all the businesses you know we were i, I remain i've got lots of friends in the media business even though we sold the business in 2011 but but the nature of media today, you've got to be so deep. We we would never have run the strategy the way people have had to run it over the past uh, decade. So you've got to be deep and not broad. And then there's just a bunch of stuff that's just very different. You, you know, um, and now this may be changing right now, Mo. But but look, uh, people for 20 years nobody's talked about interest rates going up, right? Mm -hmm. So that that has a very you know that has a very specific impact on people who depend on debt and bond to either drive growth or drive returns or things like that. So there's structural things that have changed. There's strategic things that have changed. There's atmospheric things that have changed. I'd say the last thing now is a CEO that doesn't understand technology isn't going to last long. And so I think, again, in the year 2000, you could be a general manager and run almost anything. In 2021, you've got to understand either the systemic technology of the company you're in or digital transformation or things like that. So it, it, it in my mind, changes the nature of the people who can do the jobs uh, very, in a very foundational way. Right. So that, that's actually a great segue because uh, technology is sort of, I guess, core to your new role at uh, New Enterprise Associates. And, and, and by the way, it's interesting that you had the role because you're one of the few people that have gone from running, you know, a big corporate colossus to venture capital. You know, most venture partners at most VC firms have been early founders or early staff members who have kind of evolved their companies to success, exited, and then joined some VC firm or former VC. So how, how are you able to adapt the scale of GE to the work that you do with substantially smaller companies today? Yeah, you know, when, when I retired, I, I kind of wanted to follow the path of disruption. But mainly, you know, I wanted to think small again. I, I had played on such a big stage for so long. I, I really wanted to get more fundamental in, in my approach. And I wanted to work with founders. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to work with technology. And so venture was a natural path versus uh, going to... Um, uh, private equity or so, some other some other pathway. So that's why NEA really made sense for me. Uh, I think, you know, like I know my role, you know, I'm at a point in my life where it, you show me a company and I can say, okay, I'm going to be in swim lane seven on this company. Another company, I'm going to be in swim lane two, right? So sometimes it's to coach the CEO. Sometimes it's to open up doors to help sell. Sometimes it's to build process and show people how to build process inside a company. So I think the way, the only way you can, you know, handle startups and, and work with startups isn't to kind of come in and say, you know, look, guys, I've seen this all before. Don't do it this way. Do it this way. You got to put yourself in the, in the shoes of the entrepreneur. You can say, here's what I would do if I were you. Here's the right things to be thinking about and be a helper. Right. So that's what I that, that's that's what I try to do. And the last thing is, you know, small companies want to become big companies. Big companies want to act like small companies. <laughs> and it's just this, you know, it's a circle of life. And, and uh, one of the things, you know, there was a lot to learn from Jack Welch. But one of the, th I'd say his main super strength was he learned how to run something that was big with the attitudes of a small company, right? Mm -hmm. So he, he built culture he really had a personal aura about him so that you felt like he could enter your life any day he was a great communicator but not just a great communicator he could communicate to 100,000 people to 10 people to one person to 300 people he was very he was very 
he he had a voice for every audience. He he knew how to build process and accountability. Uh, he was great with people. He he knew how to build human resources and talent. And, and those things go between big companies and, and small companies. Uh, you know, Mo, I remember like I was running the healthcare business in Milwaukee and Welch was out for a review. And he just chewed my ass. It, it, like it, it, in the review, he just crushed me. It was like three hours of pain. It was horrible, right? And then the two of us had to go down the hall and meet with the union leadership team of the of the business. So it's five hourly guys, union guys, and and Jack and like 20 feet from my office to the room was charming and funny and telling jokes. And it just had him eating out of his hands, right? So I went back to my office. <laughs> I said, Jack, where was that guy? Where was that guy? He says, they're not in trouble. You are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was just the, the real strength he had. And I try to teach that. I try to give people a sense for you know how you can how you can differentiate your communication style with different sizes of audience. Hmm. It's fascinating. That's fascinating. Um, let me come back to technology for a moment. You know, you you've, you're you're and you're the type of person that's always reading, always curious, always trying to see around corners. So, especially given your current role in the venture world, like what innovations and technologies are of greatest interest to you today? Yeah, I'd say you know. You know, Mo, look, I could, I could say like all versions of enterprise SaaS and things like that, but there's people that could talk more articulately about those than I could. So I'll give you the, kind of the three places where I spend a lot of time. Uh, the application of technology to healthcare, uh, the way healthcare is delivered. I, I think we're still in way behind the curve. If you think about healthcare and the way some of these new technologies are going to artificial intelligence or machine learning can help transform healthcare. So that, that's a big focus area of mine. I really think this manufacturing floor is going to be transformed in the next five or 10 years. A lot of the digital technologies that have gone to the CFO or the CIO haven't really made their way to the manufacturing floor. So whether it's uh, additive manufacturing or robotics, there's just a bunch of new wave technologies that I think are gonna be really uh, interesting on the factory floor. Uh, those are two. And then um, I would say just the, the, the whole nature of clean technology. And, and by that, I mean, you know, most times we have a very naive view about how climate change and technology is really going to work. And what I'm trying to do is understand some of the fundamental technologies that are really going to be required to change, uh, you know, kind of the, the, the future of climate change. You know, for instance, rooftop solar ain't going to get us there, right? It's nice, it's fun, it's attractive. People enjoy doing it, but that's not going to, that's not going to solve the problem. But really advancing battery technology or sequestration or some kind of inherently clean fusion or fission technologies. That's what it's going to take to really move the needle. So I spent time in those three areas and think those are kind of interesting places hmm. uh, to place some bets. And so maybe going beyond technology, you know, you, you certainly mentioned healthcare and, uh, you know, environmental considerations. You know, what, what changes uh, you know, when you think about the changes that you expect to see over the horizon, what, what excites you most about the future? And at the same time, what scares you most about it? Oh gosh, I, I would say, you know, this is going to sound almost trivial, but what excites me the most is there's just a bow wave of technology. Uh, you know, it's, it's really uh, transformational and it's pervasive. And, you know, I just think we're still in relatively early days to see you know, how remote process automation or artificial intelligence or machine learning or um, collaboration tools, and I could go down the list. You know, we're still in kind of early days to see how all those things um, are going to play out industry after industry. And so that's what excites, you know, there's just going to be lots of change and disruption. And if you're an investor, that's always a good, you know, that's always a good sign, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. What, what, what's on the worry screen? I'd say, uh, 
you know, <laughs> someday we will have inflation. Now, people have been predicting that now for 20 years. <laughs> but I do think inflation changes the nature of investing. And one of the things that's made alternative investments so attractive for 25 years is low interest rates. So, so which one of those continues? Uh, regulation, you know, the, the fact is, is that when I think about my poor old locomotive business, there's a hundred times more regulation on that than there is on tech, right? Mm -hmm. So by and large, tech has no regulation at all. That's going to change, right? It's going to be interesting to see how that changes. And then there's, there's just, you know, I, I don't say this out of anything other than to be an observer. China's going to have a huge impact on the world. It, it's, it's going to be the biggest economy or the second biggest economy. It doesn't matter who the president is. It doesn't matter what other things are going on around the world. And so figuring out how that China-US relationship works over time, I'd say those three things are on both the risk and the opportunity uh, side when you think about you know, what to be thinking five or 10 or 15 years out. So I'm, I'm going to double click on actually on both inflation and alternative investments and China in a, in a minute. But just before we go there, I actually you know, I, I just want to tackle one thing. I mean, stating the obvious, you, you went from being an operator, you know, with 110 or 200% of your time, you know, no entrepreneur actually fills their working hours in, in a normal, sensible, rational way. So, and now you've gone from that to being something more like 80% investor to 20% operator. How has that changed your approach and philosophy? And, and what does that mean for the businesses or companies that you invest in today? Yeah, look, I, I, I go back to something I said earlier, Mo, which was, uh, you know, it, it's interesting. I haven't taken off the table being an operator again, but, you know, I, I had done it for 36 years and I needed, I needed a break. I, I needed a time to just rejuvenate myself, be, start thinking again, you know, things like that. So, so that's uh, your, your question is very observant. I, I think, look, if, if you make the transition from operator to investor, what you really want to do is you you want to you want to fill the need that the company has, whatever that need might be. So when I sit on a board of a venture backed company, let's say there's six or seven board members, five or six let, let's say five of them are going to be pure investors. They're they're going to be spreadsheet driven. They're going to be you know if you're making your quarter you're good. If you're not making your quarter you're dope. You know that's just the way it is. <laughs> Maybe one other that's kind of a strategic and then me, right? I, I, I can be an investor, but I bring, you know, kind of experience to bear. And that's what I try to do with the companies that I work with is to sit back and say, okay, I can read the income statement. I know what your, what your revenue run rate is and things like that. Uh, give me a sense of what's not working. G give me a sense of who's not delivering for you. Give me a sense of the customer you need to break into. So what I, you know, the role I really try to play is whatever the company needs, I want to be that person. Sometimes they need a coach, sometimes they need a counselor, sometimes they need a salesman, sometimes they need a globalist. And, and my job is to be, have complete utility for the company, because that's, that's not what they're going to get. They're going to get spreadsheets. And, and that's, um, it's just the nature of the beast. Fascinating. So and now I'll come back to, um, the comment you made earlier about investing and and you know throughout your career you've you've navigated virtually every corner of capital markets and as you look out to the market today and you see this evolution of specs and you see the uh, the explosion of broader let's just call them alternative asset classes which you mentioned uh, may be affected by rising rates or inflation um you know how do you see that playing out? Where do you see the greatest risks? Where do you see the greatest opportunities today? Um, yeah, so, I mean, maybe start with the obvious one, which are, which are SPACs. SPACs been around for a long time. Um, I think in the, let, let's say around 2005, somebody came to me and said, uh, let's put your appliance business in a SPAC, yada, yada, yada. I said, gosh, this sounds stupid to me. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> and then, you know, flash forward in 2017, I come out to Silicon Valley and, and basically, no companies could go public, right? If you were Airbnb, you could go public. And a banker, let's say Goldman or Morgan Stanley, they come in and say, okay, if you give us 12 straight quarters of 30% revenue growth, if you have a perfect board, a perfect track record, you can go public. So basically, you had thousands of companies, hundreds of companies trapped 
in portfolios that couldn't do late stage growth financing uh, because the public markets were closing them basically because of the, you know, the bankers had put an artificial uh, governor on going public. And so SPAC step in with lots of liquidity, uh, SPAC step in and, and fill a role. Now, are, are there too many of them? Sure there are. And are there gonna be some that, some that don't work? Absolutely. But, you know, late stage growth investing, you know, they've just opened up a door that needed to be opened to give people access to liquidity. And, and you know, markets are going to respond to that. That's one of the great things about capital markets. So that's number one. Number two, Mo, look, I used to run a big pension fund. And, and if you didn't put money in alternative investments over the past 20 years, you got crushed. If you're trying to get a 7% return and, and your bond portfolio is returning three, and let's say the S&P 500 hopefully is doing well, but some years it's not, uh, it's been your only choice. So low interest rates have been uh, the, the really the foundation of uh, real estate, venture, private equity. Uh, I'm not saying those things wouldn't exist without low interest rates, but they've been an essential. Mm -hmm. And so lots of liquidity has gone to them. And, you know, the history of the world as we know it so far is that, that you know, that's worked well for everybody. And look, if I was sitting in the role of asset allocator, I'd probably still... Uh, be allocating a lot to alternative investments, even knowing that uh, there's going to probably be a bout of inflation as you come forward in the future. And then, you know, which one you pick is totally up to you. The returns on all three of those asset classes have been stellar over the past 10 or 15 or 20 years. And, and I think there's no reason to think they can't be uh, that in the future. But how, how, just for clarity, how would the, how would inflation improve the dynamics for traditional portfolios. Like, I mean, fixed income is still, as rates rise, still gonna be hit. Yeah, uh, look, I mean, I think inflation in general is not good for anybody. Don't, don't get me wrong. It makes, okay. it makes, it makes everybody's life tougher. Got it, the, got the only theory I would have is that interest rates might you know, go up accordingly, in which case you're gonna get a little bit higher yield on bonds, which you should, but you know, all that being said, when you look at the kind of deficits we have right now, and you look at, you know, kind of like labor shortages, lumber shortages, things like that, we are going to have some inflation. And we're seeing that, we're seeing that right now. Right. Absolutely. So, so let me ask you a very difficult and unfair question. Um, if you had a, like Tabula Rasa, you have a fresh slate and all of your assets are in cash today and you have 10 million, hundred million, it doesn't really matter what that is, but how you allocate that capital, like what would that allocation look like today? You know, I'd probably still, look, I, I'd still do alternatives, you know, at least 25%, maybe more. I'd double down on healthcare. I would, I would double down on healthcare because you're, you're going to get both earnings growth and PE expansion, right? I'd probably take some money out of tech because it, it's just, the valuations are untethered. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, there's even really good companies that are going to see reversals as time goes on. And I probably, I would either have some energy stocks or some kind of inflationary hedge type stocks in there as well. And, you know, maybe 10% bonds or something like that. But I would, I would double down on healthcare right now. And I would do, I would, I would be investing, I would save as part of my alternative, I would go into a China fund and, and I would have exposure to China right now as well. Hmm. And, and what else besides China would be in that alternative that bucket? Oh gosh, I, I think, I, I think uh, venture is still sitting on lots of, uh, I would say untapped gains that are, mm -hmm. that are really great. Uh, I, I like mid-market, I've always liked mid-market private equity because I think there's more ways to, there, there's more undermanaged companies in that space. Right. And then I, I'm, I, I uh, there's probably so many people on the call that are better at real estate than I am, but I would, uh, and I would invest in a China healthcare fund. So oh. again, the way I'd be thinking about healthcare is it's inflation resistant. It's growing like gangbusters. Um, fundamentally, no government is gonna stand in the way. You know, Biden's not gonna stand in the way. Uh, Obama tried, it was like a speed bump, okay? And, and the industry itself is making a transition from being a social cost to being a place where everybody goes to work, 
right? right. So, so we're going to live through a transition in the next decade where it's just going to become like this is where 35% of the population goes to work. They're in old folks' homes or hospitals or places like that. So I, I just think it's it's one of those sectors that is not going out of style. It's going, it's more in style. And it's screwed up. Like it's there's lots of different ways to play it. So I, I view it as being, you know, really uh, hugely investable. Now fascinating. All right, I'm gonna turn. Uh, I want to get to China, but before I do, before I do, I want to just set this scene because, and I want to turn the conversation towards the the macro environment, and and to do that, I actually want to go into a little bit into your career because you, throughout your career, you've kind of traveled the world. You've made deals with Putin and Erdogan in Turkey and General Sisi in Egypt, you know. And I know you could probably take us on uh, the the world tour of dictators and despots that you've done business with. Um, so. But you know, what are of what are some of the uh, I would say more memorable experiences there, and what should investors take from those experiences as they're considering their own allocations or exposures to emerging markets? Yeah. So um, you know, again, in the time I was CEO, eighty-five percent of our jet engines and turbines and healthcare products were sold outside the United States. Right. So. To me, you know, globalization wasn't a philosophy, it was a necessity. So I would say that uh, number one. Uh, so you gotta go where the market is, right? In my case, it was a lot of emerging markets. And the second thing I would say to investors is you, you should really understand whether or not the companies you invest in really have a plan for how to invest safely in places like South Africa or Brazil or China you know, how many people do they have on the ground? What's their risk appetite, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Not what they do at headquarters, but how well they can manage their enterprise uh, from the field, uh, really important. You should have, you know, a really an understanding of what you're investing in when you invest in Saudi Arabia or Nigeria or Germany and, and relative expectations for, you know, what problem you're trying to solve and where they are in the cycle. So that's, that's uh, key. Now, you know, the case of our products, a lot of them were, the government was the purchaser. And so you'd end up in the uh, negotiations frequently with, you know, people that were running uh, countries, right? So uh, one I would tell is um, uh, Egypt, you know, kind of after the Arab Spring and things like that, they didn't have enough power. And so uh, CC comes in as a general CC as uh, president of the country, and they need like four gigawatts of power delivered and online by the summer, or else, right. you know, there's just going to be riots in the street and things like that. So right. he asked to see me, and and I go to see him, and you know, he's a general, right? And reputation, anybody can read it. So I walk in, and I'd been to Egypt a number of times, so I knew basically what was going on in the country. And he says, you know, Mr. Remo, the first thing I, I want 10% less than what the current contract says. And I said, well, General, he says, no, 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 this is the general's discount. There's no negotiation. This is, this is what I get. I said, well, you're not going to get that. You're going to pay, you're going to pay full freight. So we do that. And then he says, okay, if that's what I have to pay, I need your guarantee um, that all of this is going to be online by June 1st, or else remember, I'm a general. <laughs> so that was that was negotiation in uh, in Egypt, in Turkey in like 2008. Uh, you know the oil prices were booming, and Erdogan decides he wants to build a nuclear power plant. And his Minister of Energy has said we can build a nuclear power plant in three years. Now, the fastest cycle in the history of the world is like 15 years. So. You know, we've got Erdogan and the Minister of Energy. He's saying it's three years. I'm saying, mm, you know, Mr. President, I'm not so sure. I think that would be a record by like 80%. So I'm not so sure. And then, you know, we're walking out with our guys and I'm saying, gosh, I wonder if this guy's going to get fired or what's going to happen to him. So you learn to navigate between the private sector and the public sector. And at the end of the day, you're representing our country. So I always would talk to the secretary of state before I would go to these places and you're navigating, you know, kind of the people that work for you on the ground. You know, we had uh, 3000 employees in Saudi Arabia who are all Saudi citizens. 
you know, I cared about them. I wanted them to feel like they were part of our company and I wanted to be their representative, just like I wanted to be the representative of people in Ohio or Florida or other places in the US. Sure, sure, sure. Fascinating. All right, so let, let's actually come back to China because, uh, you know, you've done business with them since I think the 80s. You've strongly advocated for a deeper relationship with China. I actually, I remember once hearing you joke that, you know, working with China is actually very simple. Just do whatever the government tells you. So, uh, um, and so, you know, that's, that's uh, given where we sit today and uh, all of the increasing protectionism that we're seeing in the West, we're seeing the US, China having proxy battles around the world. And, and of course the, the recent acrimony related to the coronavirus, the pandemic, how do you actually see this relationship unfolding? Like what would it take to right size it? You know, it's in the worst place that I, I can remember. And, you know, coronavirus was clearly, uh, the Chinese didn't do what they should have done as it pertains to the coronavirus. There's military and cyber concerns and things like that. So it's complicated. And, and I would be the first one to say that. What, what's not for dispute is the fact that the their economy is on the march, right? They have a vibrant tech sector, you know, have the Chinese stolen technology in the past? Absolutely. But, you know, they've graduated more engineers than the US and Europe combined for like 25, 30 years. So they have their own technology, they have their own capability now, and that's growing, you know, really dramatically. So, and, and they're, they're, they, they do what we used to do. You know, in other words, we used commercial diplomacy for decades as a country with the World Bank and the XM Bank and, you know, when they do one belt, one road, they're just following us. They're just doing the same things that, that we've done. So, so they're in the Middle East, they're in Central Asia, they're in South America, Southeast Asia. So big market, big technology, big desire, integrated government, you know, public private sector. That's not going to change. It doesn't matter who the president is. It doesn't matter uh, what's going on. The Chinese market matters. It's big. It's huge. It's investable. Now, Right. The last thing I'd say is, look, if climate change, if you believe in climate change and that it's existential, I would argue that China is actually more important than the U.S. in terms of solving a problem. So, you know, we're just playing tiddlywinks around the edges if, if we don't understand that, that a relationship with China is actually essential, right? And, and what we all should hope for as it pertains to, uh, to the future. So that's you know, Mo, that's the point we made. We always saw China as an insider. We had higher market share in China than we did in Germany. Hmm. Our margins were the same as they were in the U.S. We had a local team. You know, we protected ourselves in, in, in many ways. And I just think businesses haven't done the hard work uh, of what it takes frequently to be successful there. And my hmm. hope is there gets to be a better relationship. I understand how com complicated it is as well. And then do you think um, here in Canada, we're sort of doomed to align ourselves with the fate of the US-China relationship? Or do you think that that could actually- Look, I think it's a really great question. I, uh, let, let, me, let me be a, a, a wimp and say, I don't think the Europeans are going to align with the US at all costs. I think they're going to keep their, their opportunities open to, to do work in China, regardless of almost what happens in the US. Mm -hmm. And I think that opens a window for Canada to decide what to do. And, and mm -hmm. look, if you wanted to make, if you really believe that climate change was real and you wanted to make an impact, uh, you'd export natural gas from Canada to China and you take coal plants offline and replace them with gas, right? That, right, that right. would be, that's a natural kind of strategy, but we don't think about that right now. Right. Absent politics, that would be ideal, right? That would be ideal, politics. exactly, yeah. Right, right, right. So let's, let's, let's talk about China from the perspective of in, investors. And you've talked about, you know, sort of your, you've mentioned that if, if it was you, you would invest in Chinese healthcare, you know, and it's, it's certainly, there were for years difficulties in investing into China, now it's becoming more accessible. But perhaps in your opinion, what's the most efficient and effective ways for most family offices or ultra high net worth investors to get exposure to China? 
Yeah, I'd go through, I'd go through funds, right? So if you think about, uh, let's look at Warburg, private equity. I've got a ton of respect for Warburg. Uh, Tim Geithner, Geithner's the chairman. You know, they've been in China for decades. I'd invest in a Warburg fund, you know, and then there's a bunch of venture funds that are industry focused in China where the, the, the founder or the general partner has either been trained by a US firm or, or has lived in the US, I would, I would do both those and I would do them today, right? Mm -hmm. In other words, look over, you know, I've got more than a 30 year experience. Every time it was unpopular to invest in China, if you doubled down, you made money, right? right. Every time that, that, the, that, the, that something, um, uh, you know, pulled out, when somebody pulled out, if you pulled in, you did extremely well. We use that to our advantage for a long time. And the risk you're having is a Taiwan risk or something like that. Some macro geopolitical thing that just ruins everything. But there's so much to lose on everybody's account, including the Chinese from that, that, you know, you can plug your own ours. But funds, funds are the way to go. Yeah. Yeah. And that makes sense. And, and of course, uh, the inefficient flow of capital, you know, when it's less popular, it makes perfect sense why that yeah. would be the time to actually to allocate. Um, no, fa fascinating. I want to actually, I see this book lying on my, uh, my desk, and I want to turn to the book for a moment. You know, you came out with this book, Hot Seat, you know, what I learned from leading uh, a great American company. And naturally, uh, you know, we hit on, um, or, or the book hit on many of the items we touched on today. But Maybe even before we get to those items, you know, I'd love to learn or hear what, what you learned about yourself through the process of writing this book. And then afterwards, I'm going to ask you if, if people could only remember one story or anecdote from the book, they could only walk away from one, what, what, which one would it be? So what did you learn about yourself through the process of writing it? And you know, they could only remember one thing from it, one story from it, what would it be? Yeah, so... Um... You know, I had a complicated career, complicated company, complicated time. My career didn't end the way I wanted it to, for sure. Uh, I really wrote the book, um, you know, for two reasons. Not, not to tell my side of the story, but to, to make sure that a, a complete story was told. And I felt like my experiences and the experiences of my team would be useful to some people that are living through a difficult time. So I had a co-author, a, co a woman named Amy Wallace. She spoke to 80 people. And, and, you know, I think like whenever you allow people to tell stories about you, um, you know, there's a human nature that you only remember the 70% of every story where you were the good person. You didn't, you didn't remember the 30% of the story where you screwed up. And this made me kind of, you know, for instance, uh, Morgan Stanley came in 2007 and, or 2006 and said, you should spin out your real estate business. And I said, no. Uh, and by 2008, that didn't look so smart, right? Now, I would have remembered the story without that, <laughs> without people who reminded me of that. So, so that's hard. Um, I think when I read the story critically about myself, probably the thing that, that hurts me the most or that I feel the most responsibility for was we just didn't have as strong a team as we needed in all the different businesses. And the only way you can run a really big, complicated company is that you just have to have super talented people in every position. And they have to be people you trust. And, and there's a difference between, you know, like, like they don't have to be loyal to you, but they, you, they have to be trustworthy. And when I say trust, it means they put the company ahead of themselves. Right. I had one or two people that put themselves ahead of the company, and that just hurt bad. That, that hurt bad. So that, that's probably the piece that when I go back and read the book myself, um, hurts the most. And, and that's on me. And, and uh, don't get me wrong, we had a ton of good people. But for what we were trying to do on our size, we didn't have enough talent uh, in the end. I'd say if, if, if I was going to, you know, there's a lot of fun and uh, crisis stories, but the first half of chapter six talks about, um, you know, we were coming out of the financial crisis 
And what I decided to do was have a different leader come and spend a weekend with me each month. And I did that for eight or nine years. And they would bring their spouse. We would have dinner on a Friday night. We'd spend five or six hours the next day. And it was, uh, it was I, I had done a ton of research on them, their career. It was kind of brutal two-way discussion about career and performance. And, you know, we talked about them, we talked about their business, and they talked about the company. Right. So it was kind of a three-phase discussion. And uh, it's a way you build connection and insight. And it, I, I did it as a way to kind of recover coming out of the financial crisis. But I think that's something that it doesn't matter if you're a family office or a family business, you never know the people around you as well as you think you do, how they're doing, what they think, and, and finding ways to just get that kind of connection without the, the emails going and with nobody checking their iPhone and things like that. Uh, I would read that part of the book. I mean, and that must be particularly difficult for, or at least uh, the younger generation. I mean, you, you, you must see it all the time. You teach a course at Stanford on, I think it's called systems leadership and digital uh, transformation or digital industrial transformation. You know, so given your um, interaction with the next generation of, of leaders, you know, what, what have you seen as, what have you learned about that next generation? And, and perhaps even, you know, at a more um, uh, self-actualization level, what do you view as the most important thing you need to transmit to them? Um, yeah, so I, I would say, you know, they, they are shaped by the financial crisis and COVID. So it's not that they're anti-big company or all want to be entrepreneurs. You know, what they want is control, right? They basically say, um, you know, <laughs> life is stunk. You know, bad things ha are happening to me about every five years. And, and so, you know, if, if I start a company, it's not because it's a specific passion. It's because I want to have some control over my destiny. And you, you can understand that, right? So I, I think there's, there's a piece. Um, you know, one of the things, Mo, I've learned, having done it now for four years, is that, like, you know, mental health is a thing. And, and uh, I don't know if it's generational or people just hit it, but I see students struggle. You know, these are the best of the best, right? These are Stanford Business School students. And I see them, I, I see them struggling um, with elements of their life in really meaningful ways. So I think we all need to be cognizant of the fact that uh, this has been a really stressful time, particularly on that generation. What don't they get? What they don't get, particularly at, in the West Coast, is that things take time. You know, like, like if, again, I'll go back to climate change. Solving climate change, you know, in, 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 in ways of making, you know, kind of the earth uh, not, you know, go uh, up two degrees in warmth by, by 2050, things like that. That's a 30-year journey, right? That's not a one company, one startup, one solution. This is a 30 year journey of public policy and innovation and discipline and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I, think, I think we've done each other a disservice about you know, kind of understanding that you know, fully autonomous vehicle start to finish, that might be 20 years. Like, Amazon is a colossus. It's a, almost a 30 year old company, right? right? And so this element of time has just been um, washed out of people's minds in terms of how difficult and, and how much, you know, how much stamina doing anything that's really important really is. And, right. and I think that's, that's, that's a piece that somehow, some way, we've got to get back into our psyche. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the famous line, right? Most people, I, I don't remember who said it, but most people underestimate what, overestimate they could do in a year and underestimate what they could do in 10. That's exactly. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, it's, yeah. it's, um, it's exactly right, yeah. So I, I want to, you know, I know we're sort of running out of time, so I want to see if I could sneak in one or two more questions um, because I'm, I'm just so fascinated. You, you mentioned throughout the conversation um, 
that you've you've had some mistakes along the way. I mean, you've had no shortage of extraordinary achievements, but um, when you think about some of those, you know, mistakes, wh which would you say would be the most valuable, the most enlightening, um, and and perhaps even if you had a few do over do like do overs or things that you could do, re uh, change in your career if you could go back in time, what would you do differently? Yeah, look, I mean, I think the. Um... I'll mention one just because of COVID. You know, when you're coming out of a crisis, and this is more true for legacy companies and startups, you really do have a chance to kind of say, okay, I'm going to do something fundamental and I'm going to do something that's really going to drive change, right? And it may mean I have to take a step back to go forward, but we're willing to do that. And so when I think about 9 11, you know, we were 50% financial, 50% industrial. Uh, our industrial businesses were subpar. They had been underinvested in and things like that. But, you know, 9-11 gave us air cover to kind of step back and change the mix dynamics. Mm -hmm. What we decided to do was continue to grow financial services, use the cash to reinvest back into the industrial. And we were well on our way. And then uh, Lehman Brothers went bankrupt, right? And then the sheer size of financial services just was debilitating to the company. And, you know, that mistake wasn't made like September 15th, 2008. That mistake was made September of 2001. Right. And, and so we had a chance, we had a window to reset the place. And that's, um, you know, that's, uh, that's key. Um, personally, you know, look, I, I think if I had taken a sabbatical in, uh, let's say in 1999, before I became CEO and done it in Silicon Valley, hmm. uh, I would have had a, a vast appreciation for where the world of digital technology was going to go. And I would say almost every legacy company missed this, almost everyone from, you know, not just the GE, but banks and airlines and hospitals. And I could go down the list of, we just didn't know what we didn't know about where the world was really going to go. And as a result, I, I don't think we were as competitive as we could have been, uh, both in, internally, but also for investors. You know, the fact is, is that, you know, the sheer wealth that's been created in Microsoft and Salesforce.com and those companies really hasn't been shared by their customers. You know, again, I, I love the companies. I invest in them myself, but, but the wealth they've created really hasn't been shared by the legacy companies they've worked with. Right. I'm not saying we had to be, you know, invent, invent Outlook, but we weren't, we weren't really leveraging that technology the extent to which we should have. And that was a huge miss by all of us. Right. And so, let me just maybe end with this question. I wish I had time for another 50. But, um, you know, people have worked with you for a long time. You know, they, they, they claim that you're the consummate learner. You read more books than almost anyone else they know. Are there any books that you credit with having materially shifted or transformed your worldview? And, and perhaps if, there's, if you could leave us with you know, obviously, other than your own book, of course, if there's only one or two books that somebody must read, um, you know, that uh, that uh, um, an allocator of capital must read, what, what, what might it be? Oh, gosh, you know, I'm going to give you a very unsatisfactory answer, because I'm not going to give you a business book, I, I would say, um, you know, read military history. <laughs> so read a book about the beginning of World War II or Gettysburg, because there are books about leaders who fail and then get better. Hmm. I think the problem with most business books is they, they kind of start at the end. They start by saying, I was a genius. Here's the five-step process. You know, just follow <laughs> the five steps. Unfortunately, that's not the way the world works. What right. the world works is you make decisions, you try things, but you try not to make the same mistake twice, right? And if you think about Eisenhower from 1942 to 1945. If you think about Gettysburg from day one to day three, you know, I, I find that the ability to make decisions, fail, get smart, get better. That's what most investors and what most business people um, hmm. 
need need uh, need to know. You know, I I, I did Mo just like I loved. You know, really. Um, you know, it's always controversial when you follow somebody famous. I, I followed a famous guy uh, in Jack Welch. I loved working for the guy. I really did. The books he wrote about himself, they weren't that good, right? Because, you know, if he had allowed a book to be written about him, it would it would have been awesome because he was great and complicated and inspirational and tough and all that stuff. But when you write the book, it all gets smoothed and, you know, right. he, none of the mistakes look big and stuff like that but I, I just think in business we we want to smooth the rough edges I didn't want to do that in the book I wrote be it good or be it bad and uh you know business is just it's a learning game right it's trying things it's failing it's getting off up your butt trying again and getting better yeah Jeff that was just fantastic I uh really thank you so much for joining well, us today sharing your incredible insights with us. I, I really can't tell you how much we appreciate it and uh, your generosity of both your time and your wisdom. And we really hope we can do it again soon. Me too, Mo. Thanks. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you. And for all of our participants, thank you for joining us. If you have not yet donated, please do so by going to the donate page at the top right of the site so we can continue to strengthen pediatric mental health in our communities. Jeff, thanks again for your support of Lunches with Legends. We are so grateful for your participation and wishing everyone on the call a wonderful day. Thanks, guys.